None of you have a chance of succeeding in the biggest opportunity you have, which is building your own brand and leveraging that against your ambitions, if you don't have the macro pieces in place. The macro pieces in place are strictly mindset and perspective, strictly. The reality of how life works, everyone's ambition here business-wise is completely dictated by what's going on inside of them emotionally. There is no chance you're gonna work hard enough, produce good enough content, or anything else that's required to achieve what you want unless you're in a good place. It's as simple as that. I've done this for a very, very long time, and the reality is, is it's not sustainable unless you've got solid foundation. It's no different than building a home. The things you all sell, it doesn't matter how well you decorate the living room or how nice the color of the paint is in the master bedroom, right? If you do not have steel and concrete that holds up the building. The steel and concrete for every single human here is their emotional stability and what they actually feel. And so the thing that I've been fascinated by was I didn't realize why all my businesses were working in my 20s and 30s until I went a little further on my journey. I am the byproduct of incredible mothering. I am lucky that I had a world-class mother who built accountability and self-esteem in me, which made me completely capable of doing everything that I've wanted to do in my business career. Not everybody is as lucky as I am with the luck of the draw of who their mother or father or circumstances were. I was lucky that I was born in the Soviet Union and came to America and we had nothing and had to grow up grinding it out because I never was able to form entitlement because nothing ever came easy to me. These are just the circumstances of all of our lives, one way or another. But before we get into how you're gonna sell more stuff or build your business, you've gotta actually be in a place of asking yourself, are you emotionally capable, the macro? Are you emotionally capable to deal with it? Because the biggest issue, the single biggest issue is the single biggest opportunity all at the same time for the reality of this room. The biggest opportunity on earth for every broker that exists is making content on social media at scale. Period. Right now, in 2023, as we sit here in this room, there is no second option compared to the truth that is, if you sit in here and are capable of producing 15 to 25 pieces of content a day across four to five platforms a day that the business ambitions you have will come true. The problem is, the reason most people don't produce 15 to 25 pieces of content a day is not because you have no time. If you understood that it was the single biggest reason that you would make more money, you would find time. If you understood that you would four, five, 10, 15, 100X your revenue or your sales or your commissions, the dollars in your bank account, you would find two hours a day to do it instead of having a two hour meeting. You would find it. The reason most people do it, or don't do it, excuse me, is because they can't deal with the emotional feedback that comes with putting yourself out there. The single reason that this room, I find it very hard to believe that this room in Q1 of 2023 does not understand that social media output is a driver of business. I don't believe there's a single person that has come to this conference that does not understand that to be true. If that's true, and if you came to this conference, I think about this all the time, why are you even here right now? We're in the middle of the week, in the middle of the afternoon, why would you even be here? The answer to that always for me is, because you're ambitious, because you want something to happen, that you're putting in the work to make your thing be better. If that's true, 
That means that everybody in here is in play to execute the model that creates the growth. This is what brings me to the biggest thing that I want to talk about in this room, which is insecurity. The biggest reason 98% of this room will listen to everything I'm about to say, will do the Q&A, it has complete historical affirmation to be true, and you will leave this conference and still not do it, in the face of the truth of it working, is 100% predicated on insecurity. To me, this is the biggest pandemic in the world, that many of you will not double your business this year because you are not capable of people leaving negative comments on your social media account. To me, the craziest thing when it comes to business is that people in this room will not go and figure out how to make content, not because you don't know who to hire, not because you don't know where to post, not because you don't know what to post. All of the things that are disguised when we get into the Q&A, when you're like, ah, oh, Gary, what platform or who should I hire? What kind of camera should I use? The camera that is on your phone right now is a better camera than Hollywood was using 20 years ago. The camera is not your problem. The finding the employee to post for you is not your problem. The problem is the macro. I promise you this, the problem is the macro. You're scared to post because you're worried about what other people think. You're worried what your buddy thinks about you doing it. You're worried about somebody saying you don't look good. You're worried about that your makeup's not right, that your muscles aren't good, that your face isn't right, that you are scared. Fear is the biggest way to not make money. Fear is the biggest way to not achieve what you want. If it is true that by the luck of God, you have found yourself in the prime of your career in a market that has ridiculous upside for looking around probably the majority of the rest of the people's careers here, why would you not execute to maximize the opportunity? And the simple answer is, you fear what people are gonna say. This is like, as you can tell by the way I'm setting this up, this is like incredibly emotional to me. I am sitting here looking at thousands of people when I know 98% of you will not do what I'm about to say. Every single person here needs to make a dramatically bigger commitment to producing videos, pictures, and written words on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, LinkedIn, and YouTube tomorrow. Let me tell you why. I don't know if you've heard, it's free. I wanna say this one more time. I love when people are like, Gary, Facebook shadow banned me. My Instagram, I'm not getting as many views, I'm shadow banned. I'm like, you're not shadow banned, you just suck. These platforms are free. People get upset and I'm not getting as many views. This is why the world has become so entitled. The biggest issue in the world is entitlement. People literally paint, think about this, I'm 47, I used to pay for full page ads and newspapers, I used to pay for radio spots, I used to pay for local TV ads. These platforms are free, free. We have become so accustomed to it, we now blame these platforms and the algorithm because your Instagram post doesn't get as many likes as it did two years ago. And instead of blaming yourself because you're posting the same crap over and over, you blame the free platform. Every time I have these kind of talks or conversations one-on-one -on -one or with a smaller group, the amount of people that are capable of having accountability of what they're doing about it is almost non-existent. 
on a free platform. Consumer behavior has shifted and the amount of money that is being wasted is staggering. Meanwhile, digital's no dream either. The amount of money being wasted in digital in modern marketing is profound. The amount of brands that are overspending on programmatic banner ads on the bottom of ESPN.com that nobody here sees is staggering. Influencer marketing, one of the greatest ways to do business in marketing today, one of the worst. You could pay somebody $5,000 to do a campaign and you could get nothing. You can get somebody for 800 bucks and you get a ton. This is like the ROI of a basketball. Let me explain. The ROI of social media and modern marketing is predicated on the player. The ROI of a basketball for LeBron James is a billion dollars. The ROI for me is negative $4,000. I've torn both of my meniscuses. The ROI for a piano for me, zero. Billy Joel, a billion. A lot of people come up to me and say, Gary, social media doesn't work. I've been doing it for a year, it doesn't work. I go, the data is very clear, it works. It doesn't work for you because you suck at it. What we need to really realize in this room is it is about execution, it is about understanding, but we must get educated at scale of where the attention is of the customer. I'm so fired up about what we're about to do here in Houston and really use this epic city as a launching pad because brand is being built in social now much more than it's being built in outdoor direct mail or television. And you're talking to somebody who still tests for his dad's liquor store in New Jersey outdoor, local television, and print. Mainly, just do me a favor, don't tell my dad. Mainly, I'm wasting his money so I can speak with authority in moments like this. But, I'm always testing it because it's important to never get high on your own supply. I'll give you an example. Drive time radio, bought the right way, still occasionally underpriced. Billboards, when you don't pay the actual price for a year or six months and you buy it when they have that two month gap where they have a different person coming in and you buy it remnant, sometimes a buy. The problem is most people are just not educated. They're not practitioners of marketing. The difference about what's happening is you have a game of haves and have nots of practitioners. There are people who have opinions about TikTok and Facebook and Spotify and then there are the people that actually run ads and do creative on it. That I think is the real interesting part. When I talk to CMOs, the most interesting thing of my day, four times a day, 12 times a week, is we will play a video and it will run and they will look at it or we'll show them a picture and they will look at it and they believe that their subjective opinion of the video is the right answer. The audacity of humans deciding, I don't like that picture. We didn't like that post. The audacity of not understanding, it is not about your subjective opinion, it is about the quantum qual data after the post is made to get the insight or the sale. The lack of humility in marketing today is static. The punchline really of my talk, and, and I'm so grateful to be here with all of you is, The two things I most care about in building large businesses, and I've been very fortunate in my young life to accomplish that quite a bit, is management and marketing. And both of them are going through actual transition. And that's gonna require us not to fully change, because 80% of what we all grew up with is exactly right. But we're gonna need to tweak. We're gonna need to tweak if we keep growing the way we've been growing. Because you know this, like the biggest vulnerability is when things are good, right? Like, I'm sh- this again, when I saw five, 10, 15 years, hands up, I have a funny feeling, I have a good sense of who's in this room in my prep. The biggest thing I'm scared of is things are going well. And I'm especially concerned, though optimistic, because we've obviously gotten a very significant at bat with you, is the marketing is such an arbitrage. It's such an arbitrage. I built, uh, my dad's business went from a three to a $75 million business in seven years, and I had no money and it was because email and Google AdWords were new and everybody else was doing full page ads in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and I was buying the word wine on Google for five cents a click. 
And, and we're seeing the same opportunity right now in building brand. We're, we're outflanking with our clients at Pepsi and Procter and & Gamble and Kraft. We're outflanking competitors because they continue to buy commercials and billboards and direct mail. And we're crushing them on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, LinkedIn. But, but it does take a mental shift. There's a big difference in marketing right now which is potentially getting to people versus getting to them. And I think we're making too many decisions on what yesterday was about or what we feel good about. Or even occasionally, uh, my biggest problem is when people make decisions for their ego. People would rather see a commercial during their baseball game for their company and waste money than not see the TikToks and Instagram and make more money. I will never, to the day I die, understand that. Ego and yesterday is hurting a lot of people from growing. People thinking their subjective opinion if the picture looks good or the video's funny is stopping people from making money. I think we need to cross the T's and I's on what I've been saying here for the last 20 minutes so that you understand it because if we fall into it and go deep, there will be growth, significant growth. And on the management side, if we understand a couple of tweaks against the way we did it, with managing our people could create dramatic retention and acquisition of other employees. I think that's a great debate that I'm sure a lot of us are thinking through. So we need much more practicality in our marketing, much more, because it's meant to drive business. We also need patience to build brand. It doesn't happen overnight, but we can't waste money along the way. People get impatient and start doing the wrong thing. Staying the core, it's like working out. I'm sure, how many people, I just want to see it, how many people here at some point in your life decided for a New Year's resolution, I'm gonna lose some weight and get into shape? Raise your hands. And of those people, do you know how many quit on January 26th, on February 19th, and we see that a lot too in marketing. That story sums up what we're dealing with a lot, which is if you're gonna do something new, you have to like actually do it. You know, if, if you decided you now play pickleball instead of tennis, you can't show up to the pickleball court the third time because you haven't figured it out yet with a tennis racket. You gotta keep playing pickleball. And so I'm excited about this journey, but we're empathetic. We know it's a process, especially the creative opinion. People are so used to making a subjective call on one commercial and one billboard, and it's a whole process, and now we're coming at you and saying, we're gonna put out 15 things a day. And that just is like such a different thing because you're like, am I supposed to judge this? Does my opinion mean anything? And it's a whole to do, but, but I'm really excited about it. I think we're gonna, we're gonna build something meaningful. We sold a jet engine for GE on one post on LinkedIn and it blew everyone's minds, that company. They didn't think it could be, but marketing's the same. It's just, where's the attention? Do you put something in front of them that they want? I think the thing that the organization's gonna have to have strategic patience on is what people normally do when the market doesn't know, any, doesn't know you is you spend heavy upfront awareness, right? You hit it, right? The problem is 99% of marketing campaigns in that model fail. So my point was, and how I built everything and how I've watched all the things that have become big built, Peloton, Tesla, all of it is build up for a little while and to me, I, have, I always think whoever holds the breath the longest wins. So I wanna hold my breath as long as possible. Now, I own tons of businesses. In that scenario, I get to make that decision. In this one part of my life, I don't. So it's about a lot of communication with like, what are we doing here? Because to me, the longer you can hold your breath and do that model, the more likely you're gonna know what to put out when you spend the big dollars for that awareness. It's just logical, it's science. It's science, test and learn, test and learn, test and learn, but it's not test and learn. Every time you're doing it, you're marketing and you're getting more people to know and so it's gonna be, it's gonna be, a, fun, it's gonna be a fun journey. For me, it's not that I know what I'm talking about or what I don't know if I'm talking about it. It's that I don't understand how people don't follow human attention. Human attention is the asset. To me, you know, to hit something at very much at home for this group, people ask me all the time, what if something gets banned? What if something changes? Vine used to be big, then it got bought. I'm always like, then the attention's gonna go somewhere. If all of social media disappears off the face of the earth tomorrow, that's an opportunity for me because eight billion people are still gonna put their attention somewhere. 
whether that's connected TV, whether that's VR, you know, AV, AR, a, you know, VR, like it's, the attention's gonna go. I'll run print ads if the whole world's reading magazines. So I think this emotion, the emotion of holding up a distribution platform is a humongous vulnerability. I mean, I'm just prepared on an everyday basis to wake up and adjust to where humans have given their attention. And then I think it's very important, this is why I love this platform and always have been so pro this platform. I also think it's a good idea to bring value to people. You know, I think what's really evolved in the death of television ads is that not only have we, over the last two decades, moved our attention to other places with the growth and expansion of the internet, but the value proposition of a commercial on television is zero. You know, if the ads happen to be decent, somewhat interesting, somewhat intriguing, it could still be a much more viable medium than it is today. It's why the Super Bowl in America continues to work. But, you know, they're just not. And by the way, most TikToks are not valuable either. It's just there's so many of them on a daily basis that even if 1% is good, that's a lot of good. Whereas television commercials are low, there's not so many of them and none of them are good. And so I think we're gonna start seeing people realize no different than the thing I talked about 15 years ago, which was personal brand was gonna matter because reputation at scale matters. And all that social media has done is exposed and framed up and mapped what has always been important, which is your reputation matters. And if you can scale it, it matters even more. I think that ideas and creativity have always mattered. I think the process of getting to ideas both in Madison Avenue and advertising and in the creative field has actually become clunky, inefficient, and rewards a lot of people that don't bring any value to it. I think AI is going to have a very big impact on separating the people that have great ideas versus the ones that don't. And I think it's gonna be interesting to watch. We've got a whole audience of people who obviously uh, think of inspire creativity and bring joy as their, as their mission in life, or at least in the workplace. Um, so, you know, taking a tangent from there, let's jump into digital entertainment, right? Because that's probably the, the most practical exemplification of creativity. Um, people spend quite a bit of time on entertainment uh, on, on platforms like TikTok. Uh, but what strikes me as counterintuitive is how uh, e-commerce and online shopping is still pretty transactional and functional as an experience instead of an entertaining one. So, how do you see shoppertainment unfolding? Well, I think if I'm understanding your question in the way you're framing it, what your platform's evolving into and definitely doing in different parts of the world, because obviously the product plays differently in different parts of the world, is you're eliminating friction from what I think about shop attainment. Shop attainment has been going on forever. I started a wine show on YouTube on February 21st, 2006. Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of Wine Library TV. That is 17 years ago. It was called shop attainment. I took a camera, drank four bottles of wine in front of this new platform called YouTube that I thought was going to be big and the entire purpose of it was I want the wines that I think are good to sell at my dad's liquor store. And the way I did that, and talk about friction. Hey kids, back then you took your video on YouTube and you took the embed code and you put it on your website. So people would go to winelibrarytv.com for an embedded YouTube video and I had a WordPress plugin for comments and that's how I built community. Tons of friction. But what I was able to do was in the WordPress platform, I was able to link the products that were in the video to the website. And so you'd have to go to this website, so you didn't even find it in YouTube. You'd have to watch it, you'd have to then click on the 
desktop, WordPress, the link to the website, then it would take you to the product page and you'd have to go and shop. A lot of friction. Here we are 17 years later, you can be in a platform like a TikTok, if the quality of the content is strong, you can get more awareness from one post than I was able to build in six years of real good work and hard work. And as you continue to continue to develop the product, the frictionless nature of being able to buy the product that is in that video is gonna be one click if that, right? So I think it's always been going on. You know, people have been buying clothes from a picture on Instagram for a long time. They see it, they, even if it wasn't tagged in the photo, they'd figure it out, they'd go to Google, they'd find it. This is why Google continues to get unlimited credit for last touch attribution for things that they haven't created. The intent was created on Instagram. Google gets the credit because it's a toll booth of transactions at least in this generation, and so that's interesting. Um, so what do I think? I think this has been going on. People looked at Vogue magazine in 1984 and saw an outfit that they were interested in and then drove to Saks Fifth Avenue and bought it. Right? Shop attainment. They would watch the Oscars and be inspired by a dress and buy the less expensive version of it at Neiman Marcus, 1979. So this has been going on. All the technology is doing now is creating less and less and less friction to do the thing that's always been going on. You're in market share grab mode right now. The company's growing right now. It's like hard to both be fully foot on the pedal exploding and finding, you know, the balance of that. It's hard. It's like there's, you know, Everyone's trying to find this balance, but balance comes in the macro, not in the micro. You get balance in a 10 year window, not in like today. Like it's, it's hard to find that because you're on the offense. Like it's just hard. It's hard when you're like in the zone of like gaining muscle and losing weight to also eat cake every day. Well, hunger and hustle are part of the culture, so uh, hopefully we won't be comfortable in that place. But to the point, on the counterpoint is, I do think you can be both hungry and hustle and be happy and content, but I don't think that comes from optics. I think it comes from how you treat each other. I don't, I don't think that comes from like, let's put a foosball table in the middle of the office, or let's create coffee talks with people when they come in. I think it only manifests in truth not tactics. I think the way you'll get to that joy is if everyone's nice to each other and if you have the ability and the conviction to fire the three people in here that are assholes. <laughs> jo jo people are very confused. Joy doesn't come from four hour work weeks. Joy doesn't come from free donuts. Joy comes from firing dickheads. That's gonna be my new status. <laughs> and it's very hard because a lot of times people that are bringing the negativity to the organization are also top performers. Top performers come from two places. They're either driven by confidence or they're driven by insecurity. Most are driven by insecurity. Insecurity then starts to manifest in their day to day in suppressing others. This is where the world's got this very, you know, I think it's very possible to have a work environment where people are going very hard, but are very happy. But I only think it comes from the way we treat each other um, internally. And so that's the thing to think about.